she was the political secretary of Tony Pua. Uh, she's passionate about education, youth, and women empowerment. And most recently, uh, we followed the elections, she was nominated as the, uh, or voted as the Assemblywoman for Kampung Tunku Slang. Also, can we please put our hands together for YD Lim Yi Wei. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Have you all had your coffee? No. Oh, dear. Okay, we're going to have a tough crowd. Anyway, uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Lim Yi Wei. I am the State Assembly person for Kampung Tunku uh, State Seat in Selangor. Uh, does anyone here know where Kampung Tunku is? Yeah. No. no. Alright, that's cool. So, uh, just for you know, introduction's sake, uh, Kampung Tunku covers the neighbourhoods of SS1, SS2, uh, SS3 in PJ. We also cover the new village of Sungai Wei, as well as uh, Paramount Garden, uh, Sea Park. But I think the easiest landmark for you guys would be Burger Lab. Everyone knows Burger Lab, right? Yes. Yeah, that's in my hood. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, sorry, I'm a bit breathless um, because this morning I actually rushed off to to uh, the land office in Hululangat because we had our nomination day for the Balakong uh, by elections, and and you know this is a, one of those examples where you know politicians don't have a lot of time to think. But anyway, uh, when I do think. Um, I like to think about thinking. So today's title of uh, my TEDx talk is actually, oh, okay, here you go. Thinking fast and slow about politics. And the title of this talk was actually inspired by a book, uh -oh, okay, by Daniel Kahneman. Uh, he's a Nobel Prize uh, winner in economics and uh, obviously the title of the book is Thinking Fast and Slow. So Daniel Kahneman, although he won a prize in economics, he focuses more on behavioral sciences, how we think. And in the gist of this book, it focuses on, uh, it classifies two thinking systems that we use. So the first one he calls system one, uh, which is fast thinking, and this evolved from um, many, many million years of human beings trying to avoid being eaten by bears, you know, or to know when someone from a different tribe is coming to kill you in the middle of the night. And then the other system, uh, Kahneman calls it system two, which is slow thinking. So imagine I ask you right now to uh, calculate for me what is 16 times 24. Don't take out your calculators. You might have to uh, take a while to think and you might do a few, you know, mental gymnastics where you take out, okay, 16 times 20 plus 16 times 4 to get the answer. But the fact is that it takes you a little bit more time to, um, to, to answer 16 times 24 compared to what time is it today. So that is slow thinking. Now it's important to remember that between system 1 and 2, there are no extremes. That means um, if you're a fast thinker, you respond quickly to situations. It doesn't mean that you're always using system one. It's more of a scale, kind of like your Myers-Briggs, where you're not always introverted and not always extroverted. It's uh, your preferred behavior at different times. So how does... How, this is not... Okay. How does thinking fast influence democratic politics. The first thing is, the fact is our world is so quick today. And I can see it in myself, you know, with the advent of social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. I used to read a lot and now I'm a goldfish. I can't focus on finishing a book. And it um, made me start thinking about how does our reliance on social media or thinking fast this day influence how we perceive politics. So it's easy to point to two big factors. 
One is the marketing of politics in such a way that we have begun to consume politics like entertainment. Politics nowadays is like a reality show. Who is fighting with each other? For example, in the PK now, right now, the PKR elections are going on. And are you team Azmin? Are you team Rafizi? Are you team, I don't know, independent? It's interesting, but it's not very deep, right? And the other factor um, that, that uh, plays a lot in you know, how we think faster about politics nowadays is the media. So uh, these two factors, marketing and media, have led to what my colleague, YB Stephen Sim, who is the Deputy Minister of Youth and Sports, calls selfie politics where politicians feel the pressure to be seen doing something all the time. We feel the pressure to show people that we're exactly like you. Because a prime minister goes to the mama store, he can totally understand how difficult it is to repay your student debt. That is selfie politics. But. Yeah, so these are examples of how I'm also guilty. So these are the things that we do. And we done. But, you know, me, for example, in this picture, me holding a chainsaw means nothing actually, right? So this was taken during a Gotong Royong exercise uh, in one of the schools in PJ when I was a counsellor. But it doesn't tell you whether the tree cutting exercise was completed. It doesn't tell you whether the tender for this project was corruption free, and it doesn't tell you whether the, whether the trees got cut at all, but it looks good. So, let's run through a little exercise. Just close your eyes right now, don't fall asleep, but think of your first political memory or your first political encounter. Now, in a study done by uh, three academics, uh, Stoker, He and Barr, uh, they studied the implications of fast thinking on democratic politics. So this is one of the exercises. Now open your eyes and tell me what you think when you see this word. Can anyone shoot out a few words? Okay, go on. Okay. <laughs> okay, more? Okay, let's take one more. Okay, that's very optimistic. So in that study by uh, Stoker, Hay and Barr, they found out when they asked the first question, what is your first political memory? A lot of uh, people actually um, didn't have very passive images of politics. Only very few in the sample group remember active uh, participation in politics, such as going to protests or distributing leaflets. So the summation of that was that a lot of participants' immediate sense about politics was that it is something done to them rather than something where they are active players. And then when they did the second exercise, which was what I did with you when we just put up politics on the screen and you came up with corruption, 1MDB and all. That is an example of fast thinking. And they found out that when we apply fast thinking without going into a series of further discussions about politics, a lot of the feelings generated by fast thinking were quite negative. That means when we use our fast thinking, we actually get trapped into this circle of uh, negativity and cynicism. So we feel you know, apathetic, we don't care. We feel hopeless now, we feel disenchanted. So that study was done in the UK, but I think we can see some of um, the extra effects here in Malaysia. And I'd like to introduce to you a term called systematic depoliticization. Um, my colleague and I uh, came up with this term, and it's a, it's a practice that was perpetuated by our previous government to dissuade you from politics. 
So how did they do it? First, first, they say, don't join politics, study hard, get a good job, then only think about it. Then they threatened us. They said, if you join politics, we're going to send you to jail. And we have the University and University Colleges Act, or our coup. But then when that didn't work, when um, our students actually protested against our coup, now the trick is to distract us. They say, you know what? Why don't you put politics on the backbencher and do activism? So in my encounters with youth, We've seen two distinct groups out of this, you know, many, many years of telling the youth not to get involved in politics. So some people are just like this. I don't care. <laughs> they don't care about politics. And we can't blame them because this is many years of messaging. And others prefer to join um, NGOs or activists, uh, activism. Now, I'm not saying that activism isn't a good thing. It is, but sometimes, when you're in an activist uh, society, you tend to focus on a single cause. And you also tend to ignore the structural inefficiencies or inequalities that actually lead to the need for such an NGO. So one very good example is uh, this quote by a bishop called uh, Dom Hel Helder Kamara. And it, it says, you know, when I give food to the poor, they call me a saint. And when I ask why the poor have no food, they call me a communist. <coughs> so, how do we think slow in politics? Okay. Uh, something about this. To be honest, I haven't really got full answers to that because I'm still struggling with my addiction to social media. I mean, social media is such a funny thing. Uh, my friend just pointed out to me this week that if you go on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or any other social media, the activity you do is scroll and scroll and scroll. And somehow that feeds something in us that is a very mundane, almost calming activity. And how do we fit this with politics? There's a German philosopher called Max Weber who says that politics is a strong and slow boring of hard words. How do we square uh, this quote that basically says change is not easy, change takes time with the fast nature of our politics today? Maybe one of the ways we can do that is actually changing our perception of politics. So if we go back to the exercise just now, where you know, some of y'all say politics is about corruption, about 1MDB, about diamonds and handbags. Maybe it's time we view politics as a public good. That means it's something for all of us to participate in. And when it means it's a public good, we want it to be open to everyone. We want it to be participatory that you hear from all levels of society. And we want to create affinity where you feel that we can relate to each other somehow despite our differences. So, okay, this is the part where we actually connect the dots. So we've got the theory part all the way in front. What have you know I done that I'd like to share with you today? So in our in our encounters with youth, you know, we had the group that doesn't care and the group who prefers to go into activism. Everyone doesn't want to join politics. So what did we do? My team and I, we tried uh, softer efforts. So for example, we organized this uh, card game called a uh, card game session called Political. So Political is a card game that uh, is basically a very silly, fun simulation of Malaysian politics. And we got youths who generally don't care about politics to come in the afternoon, have a session with us, and we talk with them so that they can see the linkage between issues they don't like, such as corruption, and also, you know, politics. Who do we elect into office? We also try to broaden our uh, perspectives. So we did forums where we, we want to create affinity. So we use, uh, you know, language 
affiliated with youth. So our forum, one of our forums was called Can the Millennial Save Malaysia? And because we want to make it open, we actually invited uh, people from the other side. So this speaker here, Rahman Hussein, he's an exco from, uh, youth exco from AMNO. But we invited him all the same. One of our other forums, which is not pictured here, was actually called Young, Dumb and Broke, <laughs> like the Khalid song. And it was interesting leading up to the naming of that uh, forum because some people told us, you know what, it sounds too childish. We we're talking about youth and un unemployment, by the way. It sounds too childish. Uh, you might offend people with the word dumb. So we did the next best millennial thing. We ran a Twitter poll and people said, go ahead. So we went with that forum. And <laughs> that forum was that we got youths from all sides. For that forum, we also invited another AMNO EXCO youth, uh, Zaidel. Um, but the, the conclusion of all this is that we need to make politics accessible. We need to make politics open. And most importantly, we need to... Oh, oh, what happened to this again? We need to talk to the other side. Now, I'm going to tell you a very short story about talking to the other side. So, earlier this month, I think it was last month, I was at a forum by Sunway University, and it was about the time, I'm not sure if you kept up with the news, that um, Numan Afifi, actually my friend Numan Afifi, was let go from the Youth and Sports Ministry for being openly gay. And there was a gentleman sitting right in the middle of the room, holding up two play cards. I think one of them said, uh, I think being gay is not a problem, and will you stand for human rights? And while I applaud that gentleman for standing up for the community to live without discrimination, I also wonder if he would dare to hold those play cards in a room full of, let's say, um, more conservative or more religious people who believe that being LGBT is a sin. So if we want to make politics a public good, and if we want to review Malaysia, if we want to make politics open, participatory, to create affinity, then we have to talk to the other side. Democracy is about the majority, but it's also about finding space for the minority. It's also about forgiving individuals who might be more extreme and realizing that they don't represent the majority. And so if you want to talk about rebuilding Malaysia, it's not something that we should leave to the politicians alone. Because we talked about openness, we talked about participation, we talked about affinity, you relating to me, me relating to you. And that starts so we're looking at us, looking at our culture. Now after the elections, a lot of uh, people, a lot of parties have uh, pushed a new government for a lot of legal reform. But I think that we should also look at how we think because that informs our culture. <coughs> laws only show us, or laws only tell us what we can or cannot do. Culture shows us what we can achieve. And if we want to shape culture, we have to shape our thinking. And if we want to shape our thinking, then we have to realize how we think fast and slow about politics. Thank you, everyone.